Glad you could join us today on EdFile. Welcome to the program. I'm Ayola Kasim. A major climate action summit was held in September in California with delegates calling on national governments to join forces to step up climate action ahead of 2020, the year when global greenhouse gases need to peak and fall sharply thereafter to avoid the worst impact of climate change. An alliance of more than 60 states and city governments as well as multinational businesses are now committed to a 100% zero emission target through the Zero Emission Vehicle Challenge. Today on the program, we look at the various options of the environment-friendly vehicles available and the policies that can help sustain their usage. Do stay with us. We know that every car on the road uses electric in some way. It is used to power the windows, radio and the headlights. But conventional vehicles burn fossil fuel in form of petrols or diesels to move the wheels all the time. Then came the hybrid cars, which use electricity to assist the petrol engines in moving the wheels, but they still primarily rely on fuel. The electric motors and batteries in the hybrid vehicle are relatively small. Energy comes from the battery or the engine and um, you have the converter here to convert the current to DC to be stored inside the battery. So in this mode, my battery is um, well charged to hold the vehicle alongside um, the passengers. This one belongs to Adebola Odenike, who lives in Lagos, Nigeria's commercial capital. His is just one of a handful in the country. The price of a hybrid car is a lot higher than a conventional one in Nigeria. Adebola paid half a million naira, or $1,400 more than a similar car that runs on petrol. You make up for your costs on the vehicle in terms of maintenance. The vehicle is very durable. Your maintenance for the better part of the year is only change of oil and oil filter. You barely even change your shocks if you don't drive it roughly, or um, in some instances just your uh, inverter water pump which is what you change. So compared to other vehicles, you barely even you know, spend money on repairing things. Compared to a typical gasoline engine car, the hybrid runs um, at an average fuel consumption of 33.3 miles per gallon compared to um, the fully gasoline engine vehicle, which is uh, 15 to 20 miles per gallon. What motivates individuals like Adebola to buy hybrid vehicles in Nigeria? is the rate of fuel consumption and cost of maintenance. Along the line, they find that these vehicles also come with better advantage, clean air. Emission, basically, is, is, is pretty much the lowest when you compare this to any other vehicle on the road. A decade ago, the idea of driving a full electric car seemed inconceivable by many. But today, most of these vehicles with plugs are here to stay. According to Digital Trends, Technological improvement, stricter emission standards, and changes in consumer tastes are driving electric vehicles further into mainstream. And while they are still aren't close to replacing their gas-powered causes, their ever-increasing ranges and penchant for quick acceleration make them a far better option than they once were. Many of the most promising cars are still trucking down the long road towards production, but are plenty on the market today. Uh, about 10 years ago, I came to the West Coast and talked to a truck manufacturer. And at the end of the fascinating tour, where we talked mainly about energy efficiency, fuel efficiency, uh, I just sort of popped the question about electric uh, truck, and he sort of laughed. And uh, well, we, we, we can do it, but the battery will be as big as the truck. So we could drive around our battery, um, but no cargo. And that was just 10 years ago, where it was so sort of off the, off, off the, off the reservation as to what you might achieve in the bigger, as there is the challenging areas of the vehicle. The latest makes and models for these electric vehicles were available for a test drive at a side event during the Global Climate Action Summit. The event was part of an awareness campaign on widespread availability of plug-in vehicles and also highlighted the benefits of all electric and plug-in hybrid electric cars, trucks, motorcycles and more. Liz is a sales representative. She got her motorcycle license six years ago. 
As it turns out for her, riding an electric motorcycle is considerably less expensive, making it more enjoyable due to elimination of routine maintenance and no gas expenses. You just get up and go. Um, it's uh, all throttle. You don't have to learn the clutch um, of a regular motorcycle, and so these are really good bikes for beginners as well. I think it's kind of a fallacy that the louder your bike is, the safer you are. Um, I, don't, I don't think that that's super true. Um, these are really easy to handle, and um, they've got great braking, so it helps with safety like that. Well, it's poor mileage, um, and you get better gas mileage in the city, or not gas mileage, you get better mileage in the city. Um, so depending on the model, you get around 200 miles um, a day if you're just in the city. Highway is less. On the other end of the track is a line of exclusive rides, which feature not only favorite electric vehicles, but also the hottest EVs out right now. So this is a gear shifter, so you can, this, is, this is the instruction. Business consultant Akshay Gavai, he's one of those considering going electric who visited Pair 27 for the test drive. He chose the 2008 Nissan Leaf. Okay. Charge, charging stations round. Is that the uh, ones in green? Oh no, this blue in yeah, the, the blue. blue. Okay. In some ways, electric cars are very similar to conventional cars. The accelerator, brake, and steering wheel will be familiar to anyone who has driven a car before. So what is it like behind the wheel in an electric car? In electric, and in this one as well, as soon as you hit the pedal, the car automatically accelerates. I mean, the car accelerates very quickly. And so that's the biggest difference because the torque is instantaneous. So the power is instantaneous with electric vehicles. So the biggest difference is just that sheer sort of, you get this jolt, like almost when an aircraft is taking off, you get pushed back a little bit into your seat. So I think that's the, um, that's the one big difference. The other big difference, I think, is the, with the internal combustion engine, which you were talking about, the, there's a little bit more noise. And so there's a little bit more vibration in the vehicle with the electric vehicle and just now driving the Leaf, it's a lot smoother. There's, there's no noise at all from the, from the, from the drivetrain, from the motor. Uh, so it's very, very quiet. Uh, that's, that's another big, big difference. Akshay hopes to get one of these electric cars within the next eight months. Meanwhile, the International Energy Agency estimates that by 2030, there will be 125 million electric vehicles on the road. This is based on existing and announced policies. That figure could rise to 220 million if policies become more ambitious to meet global climate goals and other sustainability targets. The International Energy Agency says over 1 million electric cars were sold in 2017 a new record with more than half of global sales in China, while the total number of electric cars on the road surpassed 3 million worldwide, there is an expansion of over 50 percent from 2016. As recorded by the Scripps Institution of Oceanography and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in May, the level of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has hit its highest level this year. The transport sector is responsible for a third of global energy demand and one-sixth of global greenhouse gas emissions. It is also the sector with the lowest penetration of renewable energy. In 2016, only 4% of energy consumption in the transport sector came from renewables. What is very clear, renewable energy is needed to fully decarbonize the transport sector. Decarbonizing the transport sector is needed to fully decarbonize the energy sector. So we need to build on the synergies much more. And this is something we can improve. Renewable energy represent only above, a bit above 3% of the total final energy consumption in the transport sector. Only 3%. This so there is a huge potential to improve it. It is very clear that policy and regulatory frameworks are needed to improve this, so creating a level playing field is necessary. The transport sector still highly depends on fossil fuel, where there is still two to three times more subsidies on fossil fuel than on renewable energy. This is just numbers. We still have detaxation in some transport sectors, so 
so in particular aviation and shipping, which are just prohibiting the fact that renewable energy can develop. So that's the first policy measure which needs to take place, create a level playing field. The other one is to really build on the synergies uh, when we're talking about energy planning or infrastructure planning, to really think in a more systemic way in the transport sector and the energy sector. Worldwide, there were nearly 1 billion passenger vehicles and 335 million commercial vehicles on the road in 2015. The number has been rising steadily over the past few decades, fueled by rising economic growth around the world. Cities, non-profits and state organizations used the Global Climate Action Summit in San Francisco during the second week of September to pledge to buy or support the buying of electric vehicles that will replace fleets of buses and trucks that run on diesel. Any parts of the system that need to move along, and if one part doesn't move, then it doesn't happen. So from charging and infrastructure to what a new vehicle looks like to the mass transit side, which is so critical, so the last mile, you know, in London we're going to go net zero by 2050. The big thing is how to basically decarbonize that sense you can bring stuff in on electric trains, but then you need to get it from the stations to all the, the, to all the shops and all the businesses and all the, on, on all the homes. So all these different elements need to move along together. Commercial and industrial vehicle fleets burn large volumes of diesel and are responsible for emitting considerable greenhouse gas emissions. Experts say replacing diesel engines with those powered by batteries can reduce emissions and air pollution and for certain cases, such as package delivery and city transit, this will enable them to save money on fuel and operating costs. People stopped going to the shops and now they're ordering everything, which when we were thinking about this 10 years ago, we said, so let's have people avoid trips and then they can order everything online. And now they're doing it and we're like, what? Wait. So it's sort of, there's something wrong. We have assumed that the private sector would be very good at logistically organizing these things. They have, but they also found out that it's cheaper for them to have less stuff in the warehouses and more of it on the roads, because it's free to be riding on the roads with the merchandise there. And that's why we also have to have road pricing. And Germans are very good at that. They're actually charging per kilometer for all these trucks. Electric vehicles fight climate change by powering transportation with electricity, not fossil fuels. Driving an EV can cut fossil fuel emissions in half and even eliminate them entirely when powered by renewable energy sources. We've become the biggest producer of offshore wind almost overnight in the UK. And that was seen as a slightly crazy thing to do by most people about five or ten years ago. And part of the reason was that it, it took about uh, three months to put a wind turbine into the North Sea. It took all this permitting, auctioning, it was very expensive with the subsidy, et cetera, et cetera. Now the last turbine went in recently in 12 hours. So that was a hundredfold productivity increase. So if you want a new industry, a new economy, one that creates jobs in every corner of the country, one that is clean, one that is about skills, innovation, uh, all of the sort of training opportunities that come. Then offshore wind and the transition out of coal has been phenomenal. Now the reason I start with this story is of course when you're producing an electric car, you don't want to power it with coal-fired electricity, you want to power it with renewables. And uh, the question you get asked the most coming out of the UK is about how are you managing suddenly now that you're getting 40-50% coming into your grid from renewables? That's just not possible. The grid can't handle it. Well, the grid can and is handling it. It needs smart grid technology. It needs innovation at all different levels. But it, it, it is possible and it is happening. And the price of offshore wind is halved in two years. Imagine getting halving of nuclear or coal or gas prices in two years. It's impossible. Private sector investment is happening and policies exist. The International Renewable Energy Agency also says the technology is available. All that is needed is to put all this together in the right way. And as it has been seen with many countries where renewables are taken off, significant change will happen. The road to a cleaner, greener Lagos and indeed Nigeria is very long. But a group is driving on that road and they believe the destination is not as far as anticipated. Femi Oye, 
and Mike Logoye are two Nigerian young entrepreneurs trying to change the status quo. Serial entrepreneurs, they have invested in green electric two and three wheelers which are currently being assembled in Lagos. This is what we call sustainable transport. This is what we call electric vehicle. It's charged by solar. It doesn't have any emission. It doesn't have any pollution. It has very limited changing parts that you need to replace. It doesn't have engine. It doesn't have oiling. You don't need to, I mean, most of the, the brake is bad and all of that. You don't have any of that. Everything is electric. The country's power supply is undependable and in some cases, non-existent. We, we look at the challenge that we face in this part of Africa and uh, we we'll start asking ourselves the question, how can we come in? How can we solve this problem? Then we we'll, were very vast in our uh, solar energy and we discover we can actually convert uh, some of these vehicles held there to solar uh, vehicles. Apart from cost, the problem the team also faces is technology adaptation. Government policies, infrastructural decay and enabling environment are all part of the obstacles the green industry is facing in Nigeria. An international infrastructure acceleration for the rollout of zero emission vehicles at the Global Climate Action Summit was accompanied by major announcement of 100% zero emission vehicle targets by 26 cities, states and regions as well as businesses. The summit claimed transportation electrification as an essential action step with its hashtag ZEV challenge, calling out major constituents to deliver an acceleration of a clean transport rollout across the world. Hashtag ZEV challenge brings together leading initiatives for states, cities and businesses. When you get to scale and then the unit cost comes down and then it makes sense. Uh, for the industry and in a way we're doing, this group and Zed is doing what, you know, what some in some countries and some businesses in the solar sector did, which was say, take some upfront costs, be very regulatory and be very sort of heavy on the government policy environments, but then have a lead on what is the future. Nearly three million automobiles will be sold to commercial and government fleets next year, according to projections by the United States Energy Information Administration. That is roughly 18% of all automobile projected sales in 2019. If these new vehicles were electric, those businesses and government would save money on gasoline and reduce their costly dependence on volatile global oil market. At the same time, they will reduce vehicle air pollution and help ensure better health for the communities in which they operate. To facilitate this electric future, Mobility experts say we need to go back to basics. They argue that consumers want convenience and reasonable costs. That means investing in charging infrastructure, not least a network of highway charging stations to make longer distance driving convenient. Canada all the way to Mexico on uh, I-5 or Interstate 5. And I don't know how many times anyone's going to necessarily do that, but the idea that you can, because people don't buy cars for what I do all day, every day, it's for that, that one time I do want to drive from British Columbia all the way to Mexico. So we've got to make sure that, that that's filled in. Um, and so being able to get the infrastructure out in ways where um, people with the, with the imagination that they bring to cars and what they want the car to do for them, yes, it can absolutely fit that. And then also making sure that we have them the infrastructure in places that I talked about a little bit um, in, in my remarks, which is where people are, where you're going already, where you're, like, the car's going to be there for a couple hours when I go on a hike. It's going to be there for a few hours when I go to the beach. It's going to be there for a few hours at the movie theater. And, and just making sure that we really have the infrastructure in places where it's just, it's just easy. You don't have to worry about it. You show up. If you need a couple more miles, you can plug in. Um, I think that's going to be the challenge, and making sure communities all around um, California and the world are kind of thinking about that, and where, where do we want that infrastructure in our community, and how do we just start getting it out there? One thing that is certain is that e-mobility can significantly contribute to reducing local air and noise pollution. The International Renewable Energy Agency's analysis indicate that if air pollution emissions from conventional vehicles were valued by their impact on human health and agricultural crops, external global costs from the use of fossil fuels and the transport sector will be in the range of $460 billion 
to $2.4 trillion per year, based on 2010 data. Bringing new, new partners together, um, so the digital sector, the grid, the utilities, the battery researchers, the, the manufacturers, the new manufacturers who might come in and disrupt the current. This is the set of, and then the, the, the charging stations, the local authorities, parking, motorway, you know, the, the, the complexity of what it takes to make this kind of shift is much more than if you're just bringing in, hard as it was, solar panels or offshore wind, or this is so economy-wide and multi-sector that the governments at all levels have to show the leadership to set the frame and say, this is happening, this is what we want, we've got local citizens buy into this, it's going to happen. So everybody needs to stop and think strategically about their part in this new story. Falling costs of electric vehicles and solar panels could halt worldwide growth in demand for oil and coal by 2020, a new report has suggested. A scenario that takes into account the latest cost reduction projections for the green technologies and countries' pledges to cut emissions finds that solar power and electric vehicles are game changers that could leave fossil fuels stranded. Polluting fuels could lose 10% of market share to solar power and clean cars within a decade. Currently, the transport sector is almost completely dependent on fossil fuels. It contributes approximately one quarter of all energy-related carbon dioxide emissions to the atmosphere, which is said to go to one-third growing faster than any other sector. By 2035, electric vehicles could make up 35% of the road transport market and two-thirds by 2050, when it could displace 25 million barrels of oil per day. Under such a scenario, coal and oil demand could peak in 2020, while the growth in gas demand could be curtailed. It could also limit global temperature rises to between 2.4 degrees centigrade and 2.7 degrees centigrade above pre-industrial levels. While more ambitious actions by countries than currently pledged, along with falling costs of solar and electric vehicles, could limit warming to 2.1 degrees Celsius and 2.3 degrees Celsius. This will drastically reduce the revenue from crude and Nigeria would be dealt a major blow if the economy was not diversified. To scale production of the electric vehicles, the SME funds team are training people in green technologies. The government that is still thinking 30 years backwards, when we need to begin to look at how we want to get position and take advantage of this era, whereby we have huge population in Nigeria, there are youth, they are creative Nigerians, they are smart. We understand how to go about it. All that we need is the environment, is the honest desire, it's the government policy. It's just the little push that is needed for Nigeria to begin to achieve and stay at the front burner of all of this innovation and the changes that we want to see. So what we've decided to do is to assemble young Nigerians because we travel around and we see these technologies. They are not rocket science. All that we need is just to encourage young people and show them the way. Urbanization and rising incomes have been driving rapid motorization in the cities. If no action is taken, these cars threaten literally to choke tomorrow's cities bringing with them a host of negative consequences that would seriously undermine the overall benefits of urbanization. Many believe green vehicles in Nigeria are going to give a very significant lift to the economy because across the world, mass transit buses are now running fully green in favor of those cities. They say this is possible here just as the situation is in South Africa, where private investors are already focusing on green vehicles. Experts argue that government policies and legislation would be required to promote and encourage organizations that are looking at green development in the country.
That's our program for the day. Thank you for watching our inbox at file at channelstv.com. It's available for your comments and questions. You can also follow me on Twitter from me, Ayola Kasim, and the FBAR crew here in Lagos. It's bye for now.